Matthew 18, and I'll read starting at verse 12. And it says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. As you're preparing to take your seats, help me introduce the message or the title for the message. Everyone say, I'll leave, I'll leave. the 99. You may take your seats. I'll leave the 99. For those of you that may not have been with us, we have started a series entitled, Did He Say That? Well, we are intentionally going back and reviewing some of the parables of Jesus Christ. The idea is, if we can go back to some of the things that Jesus said, we might get a chance to unearth, recover, relearn the person that it is that we follow. It is my personal belief that sometimes we have taken for granted our Savior. And in that, we think we know some things we may not know. And so our faith constantly causes us to relearn to make sure that the one to whom we serve is the one to whom has been described in the scriptures. So I open with, um, with a movie reference. As many of you all know, I love movies. We've gotten our church into the point of starting to try to make movies, so continue to pray for us in that. But one of my favorite Liam Neeson movies is the movie Taken. Oh man, it was one of my favorites and he plays of the character Brian Mills. Brian is a retired CIA agent who is uh, divorced from his wife but is trying to stay in close contact with his daughter, Kim. Now, while they're going through all of the challenges of what that means, he is retired just so he can be close to her, she comes to him with this amazing proposition. She's been good in school, done all of these things well, and now she has the opportunity to travel with a friend to Paris. I mean, this is a dream. And she comes, and of course, her father, knowing what he knows, kind of is a little concerned about letting her go. But he also knows he's distant from her. He wants her to be happy. And mom and now stepfather are all in line, and he doesn't want to be the one to slow her down. He grants permission and she goes on this amazing trip, her and her friend. They are living it up. Now, I don't know who these people are because I won't be sending my kids. I barely send them to Chicago to their grandparents. I don't send, like, we take them. But anyway, you know, I digress. That's not the story. The movie is they were sent. They go, they have this fun time, and unwittingly, they allow some young man to know that they are there by themselves. This young man is part of a gang that is trafficking in humans. He comes back, and while she is on the phone with her father, the kidnappers break in as she watches them snatch her friend. Father, heart has to drop, communicates to her the best things to do to try to be safe in the moment, gets her to hide and keeps him on the phone. And as they wait quietly, as the kidnapper enters the room, we hear her snatched away, her voice screaming, and the father's on the other end knowing there's nothing he can do in the moment. And in 
beautiful cinematography. They have the kidnapper see the phone, picks up the phone to see if someone is there. And they give what I think is the best speech in cinematic history. This is my vote. The best, guaranteed. He says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But I do have a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Sounds like some people know the story. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. Now, if you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. The last thing he hears is the kidnapper say, good luck. Now, much as, as that, that statement and that speech grabs me, I have to be honest, the situation that causes it haunts me. As a child, I remember how scared I was getting lost. But when I became a parent, it's nothing like the fear and the worry of my child being lost, being missing. And I know that children rarely understand that. They ask all of these things, and loving parents try to comply as much as we can, but it's so many times where the concern that sits in my heart is, if I let you go there, if this is to happen, I don't know what I'd And this background prepares us to investigate today's parable. What would you do if you had a lost child? Now, in the Matthean text, in Matthew's text, they write this story and this parable shows up slightly in a different place than it does in Luke. And Matthew is trying to communicate something to us. And I love how Matthew depicts the disciples. He depicts them as very real people that are still trying to learn the faith that ain't figured it all out. They're sitting after they've seen Jesus do some amazing things. And scripture tells us, if you go back to verse 1, that they go to Jesus, the disciples themselves, those who walk with Jesus. And they ask him this question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Now, before I immediately look at them side-eyed, they had just seen Jesus transfigured, at least a few of them. On this mountain where Jesus is transfigured and he, his clothes and body begin to glow, he is then surrounded by both Moses and Elijah. These venerated I images and people of History are surrounding Jesus. And so I imagine them, just like many of us, start to have the goat conversation. For those of you that don't know what goat means, greatest of all time. We do this in many sports, right? Like there's the ongoing conversation, Michael Jordan or LeBron James. That's ridiculous. We already know the answer to that. And, my, and LeBron is amazing. He's absolutely wonderful. But let us be clear. <laughs> we have the conversation about baseball players or the best, uh, the home run hitter. We have it, the best track star or the best Olympian. And we have even the greatest of all time as it relates to tennis. When Roger Federer retired this year, but we also recognize 
who really was the GOAT. When crowds filled stadiums to see Serena show up in black, whether she played her best or not, we were excited. She retired and the whole tennis world went crazy. I wanted to buy her clothes. <laughs> but I figured that might miscommunicate some things. <laughs> they come up to Jesus now because they have been uh, accruing a whole list of benefits, and they're trying to figure out what is placement in the kingdom. Maybe they're trying to understand how they stack up. How do we compare to the venerated leaders of the past? Because Jesus, you must now admit, we've done some things that no one else has done. We've never heard a story before of 5,000 people being fed with two fish and five loaves of bread, but we were the ones that passed out the bread and the fish and we collected it back. In fact, Peter could stand up and say, now I know y'all was there that night, but remember when y'all was all scared about Jesus walking on the water? I was the only one to get out the boat. I put my foot upon the waters. I walked out there like Jesus did. And then one of the other disciples was like, and then you fell because you got scared. <laughs> you know they were just like us, right? And so they're in this back and forth. And mind you, they're going through all of this. And then they enlist Jesus. Jesus, help us. Who's the greatest among us? Littered with their list of all the things that should matter, all the people that they have preached to, all the folks that have received sight, the folks that they have healed, the places and the plans that they have been a part of. Jesus, tell us who is the greatest in the kingdom, even if they weren't. They were collecting stats to maybe enter into the conversation. And Jesus does something mind-blowing. Scripture says he grabs one of the children and sets them into the midst of the disciples all of these who have done amazing feats. It says the greatest is like one of these. The humility of a child. And he says some other stuff. He says, and far be it, and, and woe to you if you will cause one of these little ones to fall. If you will cause one of them to move away from the faith or if you are a part of their falling away from what God had, woe to you. He even says that their angels are before God's face every single day. The greatest is, is like one of these. And this is now the preparatory ground that he begins to communicate what God is like. That God... And God's kingdom is not the same as our kingdom. That God doesn't move like we move, but God does something absolutely amazing that in face of all of this, instead of doing what the disciples would have expected for God to do and, and lift up the things that they would have thought, he says, I'll leave the 99. Can you believe he would say that? Now, listen, I get it. This is church. Many of you have heard this story a gajillion times. It is consistent with what we've heard all of our lives. But how, have we investigated this though? Like, seriously. You have a hundred sheep. One hundred. You are on side of a hill. And one little wretched sheep because it must be wretched, because why I walk off in the first place? <laughs> One little wretched sheep gonna go off and mind his own business. And you mean to tell me that out of the 99 good sheep that were listening to the shepherd, you gonna leave potentially at peril the 99 to go for the one? They doing what they're supposed to. They're where they're supposed to be. They're following the directions. They are benefiting from your protection and your care because they are where they ought to be. 
You mean to tell me that I have done what I was supposed to do? I am where I am supposed to be? I am following what I'm supposed to follow and you gonna leave me? I would get it if maybe that was a real big sheep. Maybe that sheep just gave off so much wool that you're like, ah, that one sheep is kind of worth the 99. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's not what we're talking about. In, in this saying, what Jesus is trying to do is he is trying to break a very human way of thinking about things to collapse upon them the thoughts of the kingdom. And in the same ways that it did not make sense to the disciples, it probably would have felt offensive to them. It probably feels that way to us. That when given a picture of the kingdom, God is not the one that stays with the good ones that come close. But God is willing to leave the 99. Leave them on a hill. In Luke's attestment, it doesn't say a hill, it says the wilderness, communicating even more potential peril that could befall them if the shepherd was to walk away. And this is how he measures up the kingdom. He says, I get that you've done what you're supposed to do. And I get that you're trying to use this as a way to jockey for position in the kingdom, but the kingdom of God ain't like that. See, what has happened is you've gotten so used to human and worldly systems that you've started to apply human worldly logic to the kingdom of God. But can I tell you, that is not how this applies. I don't care how good you've been. I don't care how many people you've touched. I don't care how great you think you are. I don't care about your stats, your celebrity, your influence. I don't care about your wealth or your money. None of that will move me in a different way. You don't walk in to the kingdom and become special because other people think that you are special. We have to change the way we think. And I speak this to the 99. Because if any of you are like me, I know I have gone to God with my request and I have used my list of why he should bless me. God, I've been faithful. God, I've shown up again and again. I've done my best to follow your rules. I'm not trying to say that I'm perfect. I, I've made mistakes, but I ain't made them type of mistakes, God. And when I made mistakes, I was humble. I came back to you. God, please don't leave me now. Can you believe he said I'll leave? And that this becomes the picture of the kingdom. So this might be troubling for some of us especially when we come to church, watch church, and we use this as a way to jockey for position for God's favor. And I know we would never say that out loud, just keep looking at me and nobody know I'm talking about you. But it, I know, I know that we've had those moments where in prayer when we talk talking to God, we begin to think about all the good things that we did. Well, God, you know, gas is like 650. I paid that gas price to go to church, Jesus. Because that's how much you mean to me. Right? God, I did it for you. I took the time. I, I did what you asked. And he says, that's not the kingdom. Now hear me. That doesn't mean that God doesn't value those things. That doesn't mean that you should stop doing those things. It means that you cannot measure your greatness Amen. in the kingdom yes, by those things. That it's not your title that makes you great in the kingdom. And if that's the truth, then that challenge the, challenges the church. Because then we can't just always celebrate the political leaders when they come to worship with us. We can't just get excited if a basketball player or NFL star shows up. We can't roll out the carpets for them just because they have status when they come to church. 
but we ought to be rolling out the status when somebody who walked away came back. We should be excited when somebody who was strung out came back. We, we should be excited when the person that's all messed up says, I want to give my life to Christ. And maybe they do it 75 times over and over again. You know you've been to the church where the same person gets saved a hundred times. And we like, listen, if you ain't got it by now. <laughs> but maybe we shouldn't think like that. Maybe the kingdom is like if they keep trying, they're communicating something, and maybe God is still working upon their heart. Maybe that should make us more excited. And, and watch this, watch this. This is, this is important because in the Matthean text, the way he's couching this is these are not those who are completely outside of the faith. These are those who have been weak within the faith that during the pandemic have been lost. That have fell off. That maybe we don't see anymore. And instead of us running as business as usual, it should not just be pastor does this, but we all should be looking to see who is no longer here. What's happening in your life? And not from a place of privilege or condemnation, but what about if we actually just cared and checked on people? He said, I'll leave the 99. But not only that, he says this, I'll leave the 99 to search for one. Nothing in the description of the one that is lost communicates that the one that is sought after is more valuable than any of the other 99. One could make the argument that the one that is lost is more feeble, more prone to stray, weaker even. And God says that the kingdom of God is more concerned about those who are weak than those who are strong. And the concern rises up because God knows the need. I've often heard, right, we, we hear the analogy, like if, if a house is on fire, nobody questions why everybody is talking about and trying to help that one house. That doesn't mean that other houses on the block may not have needs. It might be a plumbing issue in the house next door. Somebody might need to fix some electrical in the house around the corner. But the emergency that is dealing with the house that is on fire means that all energy and focus goes towards that house. And he says, this is how the kingdom should look. Now, in the Luke, Luke in text, right, Luke says that this also applies to those who are outside of the fold. Jesus is being questioned for why he sits with tax collectors and sinners. Why would you even be around these people? And Jesus is like, because what you don't know is what I know, is that these are my father's children. And in the same way that my father cares about you, my father cares about them. Therefore, we have to be around them. That them we can't separate from because them are the ones that God is sending us toward. That this is why there always has to be an evangelistic focus even within ministry because it's not just about the 99. But often it is about the one. And this is, is said in a cut country and a culture where it is amazingly hard to evangelize. And, and listen, I recognize my privilege. My profession is church. Everything about my life is church. I'm easily able, in fact, expected to do things that revolve and regard the church. It's, it's no anomaly that I, I have time to pray. It's no anomaly that I tell people about Jesus. That is expected. However, the problem is, is we've gotten to the point where we expect only 
the pastor. Only the ministers. Only the deacons to have to be the ones that talk about Jesus. And, and I get it, this might be your cross to bear that when you go to work, there, there's an a, there's a atheist, somebody that might be offended when you pray over your food. There, there's somebody there that might wear a, a, a cross upside down on their shirt and they, they push against your faith. God is still calling you. Because that may be the very lost child that God is going after. And this is amazing, right? Because they're talking to Jesus and they don't know that Jesus is literally describing the mission God has him on. When Jesus comes to earth, he leaves all the beauty, opulence, and wealth of heaven. He walks away from the most influential, celebrated, status entity in all of the cosmos to come and be surrounded by individuals that pale in comparison. He had been in perfect harmony with God himself and God and he and spirit move in such harmony that it was nothing but utter beauty there. No darkness available yet. He is sent on mission to leave all of those entities in heaven, the angelic host left behind to come and search for the one. Can you imagine he had been around the greatest orator that had ever lived? One whose words were so powerful that when they were uttered, they literally became. His let there be could not be if it wasn't let there be. Soon as let there be left his lips, it automatically became because creation was waiting for him to speak. And yet Jesus now is surrounded by people who do nothing but lie with their lips and words mean absolutely nothing. He left the 99. He would come and he would leave the author of the cosmos, one who had put such amazing order in place that things would work like clockwork, that people could study them, that we're still studying them to try to understand the science that God utilized to put things into their place and keep them there. And he would walk into a chaotic world with no order and recognize just how far they had fallen from their creator. He left the 99. He walked away from all of the beauty and joy that will be wrapped as it is in heaven where there is nothing but being seen in fullness, fully understood and fully known to come to a place where people will scandalize him, question his credentials and wonder if he was who he was when he had the nerve to be there before there was a was. He was there at time zero. He was part of the creation team. He was part sent out and there would be those to whom he had created that would question his very being. He left the 99. And what could cause a God to be willing to give up all of that? What could cause a God to be willing to walk away from all of that? It's the love that that God would have for the lost sheep that's on the side of the hill that needs God, help. Can you see it? That God's love for us is so amazing that he would leave all of that to come for you. Come for messed up you. Broken you. Inconsistent you non-truthful you, over and over asking for forgiveness, you, knowing that you don't mean it because you've already planned to do it again, you. But his love was so amazing that he came anyway, would leave those that didn't need him immediately 
to come to the one that had an emergency situation, knowing that you didn't know how much peril you were in, but our God said, I'm willing to come and wrap you up because I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want, but I got a particular set of skills. I got a particular set of skills that can work for people like you. Because he loves us like his children. He loves us like his children. He seeks us, comes for us, takes us as his own. And I don't know who may be here that you've never experienced a love like that. Amen. Not a love that requires you to be something other, but a love that grabs you as you are yes. and allows his love to transform you after you have experienced. Do you know that God loves you like this? And he doesn't love you because you have some status or title. It's not your bank account, not your clothes, not your intelligence, not your beauty, not your height or abilities. Our God just loves you. And all of the scriptures are literally God's love letter to his children, hoping that you would see how much he cares. And he wraps himself into flesh to come to break any kidnapper such as sin off of your life that you might have the freedom to be with him again. Do you know how much he loves you? There's a song by David Crowder and it says, <clears throat> I'll try. <laughs> he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. And I know you know the refrain. You can sing it with us. He loves I'm going to have us sing it again. I want you to sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you know he's talking to you. Sing it like you're singing to an audience of one. <laughs> 